Welcome to Tutorials Point. In this video, we will see the different constraints that are defined for REST and which makes an API truly RESTful. There are a few constraints for REST and there are totally six different constraints. The first constraint is the client server constraint. The second one is statelessness. The third constraint is the cache constraint. The fourth one is the uniform interface constraint. The fifth one is the layered system constraint. And the last one is the code on demand constraint. Of these six different constraints, the first five constraints are compulsorily necessary. And the last one is optional. In the next slide, we will see what a client server constraint is about. So the client server constraint states that the REST application should have a client server architecture. So what do we mean by client? A client is something that requests your resources and a server is something that holds the resources. So something which is requesting the resource is called a client and something which is holding the resource it is called a server. The client server constraint states that these two clients and servers should be separated and the principle behind client server constraint is the principle of the separation of concerns and a same machine can act both as a client and as a server. The advantage of client server constraint is that the client and server are completely decoupled and completely separated. And because of this, they can evolve independently. The client can move from one version to the other without disturbing the server. And the server can move from one version to the other without disturbing the client. Clients need not know anything about business logic or data which is used to process the request and only needs to worry about how to get the data and how to show the data to the user and servers do not need to know anything about the front-end UI. In the next slide, we will talk about the statelessness constraint. The statelessness constraint states that the server does not store or should not store any session related client data. It means that everything that the server needs to understand with respect to a particular resource has to be contained within the particular request and the server will not store any data related to the client whereas the client is free to store the session information in its own context states that the communication between the client and server is stateless and it means that all the information is contained within the request so for example we have a client and we have a server. The first interaction between the client and server happens and the client is in some state. For example, it has got some information about products and for example, for the next subsequent interaction, it needs more information about a particular product. So that context in the state in which the application has been requested is included within the request itself. Because the client can store the session information, the client can take the session information and pack it up and send it as a request to the server. The server only by analyzing the request will understand the exact nature of the request and sends a response back to the client. So doing this, the advantage is that it is scalable because we do not have many inter-server interactions that a client sends and it also increases the visibility because if you take one particular request you can completely understand the nature of the request only by looking at that request so it increases visibility the downside of statelessness constraint is that because all the information needs to be included in a request to the server it decreases network optimization or it requires more network bandwidth 
to actually send out a request because of huge amount of data that client is sending to the server. The next constraint that we will talk about is the cache constraint. So the cache constraint states that when a server sends a response to the client in its response it should indicate that whether the response can be cached or not and for how much duration the responses can be cached at the client side. So it requires that it indicates whether a response is cacheable or not and if a response is cacheable the client will go ahead and cache that response in its own system and because of this it need not send out additional requests to the server to fetch the same data which actually improves your network optimization. For subsequent requests the client can retrieve from its own source and no need to send the data to the server again and as I said it improves the network optimization and users will perceive that they are getting their data very fast and the performance of the application will be improved but the downside is that users may have to deal with stale data. The next constraint that we will talk about is the uniform interface constraint. The uniform interface constraint is the key constraint that basically differentiates your REST API and a non REST API. So what it basically means is that there are huge number of different varieties of devices out there. You have mobile phones, you have tablets, you have desktop computers, PCs, Macs and so on. So each and every different client device they should not be requiring a different way of interacting with the server. So for example, the way in which a mobile phone interacts with your website to get the data should be completely the same in the way in which your laptop could interact with your server. So basically it means that different types of software applications they need a uniform way of interacting with the server and there are four key elements to uniform interface constraint and some of them you must be already familiar. The first one is the identification of resources typically by an URI. We have already seen that API slash products slash one when you say a URL like this or when you give a request to an URL like this, you are basically identifying the resources through an URI. The second one is the manipulation of resources through representations. So when a client sends a request like this, he basically gets a JSON response. And the JSON response is nothing but the representation of the resource. So all what the client has is nothing but the representation. He does not have the resource. So this actually states that you can actually change the resource which is basically held at the server through the representation that the client actually has. The third one is the self descriptive messages for each request. And as we already saw, the statelessness constraint states that the server cannot hold any state. It, it also means that the client, when it is sending out any request, it needs to include all the details so that the server can completely understand the nature of the request. So for to do this, you need the messages or request to be self descriptive. The fourth one is the HETIOS or hypermedia as the engine of application state which basically means you need to include links for each response so that the client can discover other resources very easily. So the advantage of uniform interface constraint is that it promotes generality as all components whether be it mobile phones and laptops they interact in the same way. The next constraint that we will talk about is the layered system constraint. The layered system constraint tells that the architecture needs to be composed of multiple layers. For example, 
you can have an architecture with multiple layers like this where each layer is responsible for a specific function and only interacts with the layer next to it. So one layer may not know anything about the rest of the layers other than the one immediately next to it. One fine example of this is the MVC framework. In MVC framework, you have model, view and controller where model deals with your data and the database. The view only deals with the output, how the output has to be presented to the client and the controller only deals with the incoming user request. So this is a fine example of a layered system. And each layer doesn't know, as I said, anything about the other layers other than the one immediately next to it. Because of this, it limits the complexity that can be introduced at any single layer as the layers are completely decoupled. One advantage of the layered system is that security. For example, if you have any attack on a particular layer and since the layers are completely decoupled, that particular security hole is only restricted to this particular layer. So the security breach may never really reach the inner architectures. And of course, the disadvantage is the latency. For a particular request, the request has to travel through several different layers to actually generate a response. And the last and the final constraint that we will talk about is the code on demand constraint. So of all the six different constraints, code on demand constraint is the only optional constraint. So usually a client will download the data from the web API, whereas the code on demand constraint says that in addition to data, the servers can also provide executable code like for example javascript or any applet to the client and the client can actually go and download that code and execute it on the client side. Since it deals with the transformation of code, it poses severe security threats and it also reduces visibility and this is one of the prime reasons why this constraint is not enforced and made optional. Thank you. Tutorialspoint.com Simply easy learning.